these layers of sharing, we've been exploring the ways that Jesus invested deeply in the friendships around him, and we discovered that there are layers to his sharing. What I mean by that, he had layers that we've been peeling back and looking at, and now we're hoping that we can go deeper with one another in relationships with each other, and also in our relationships, of course, with our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to review for you for just a few moments. Um, Jesus, he let individuals know that he was excited. He had no problem saying that. We saw that clearly in uh, the first week when we looked at Luke chapter 10. Uh, Jesus was ecstatic. I mean, he was so filled with joy in the Holy Spirit when his disciples figured out that they had authority in his name to cast out demons. And yet, Jesus always honed in those emotions and he always had big picture. And so, even though he was experiencing great feelings and emotions, and that's what that whole first week was about, feelings and emotions, but Jesus reeled those in and he said, I'll tell you what to really be excited about. Hey guys, it's great that demons are subject to you in my name, but here's what you should really be happy about. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what you ought to really be happy about. Uh, so yeah, Jesus always reeled in the emotions. He allowed him himself to experience feelings, but he had this element of control over the feelings and emotions at all times. So that when a woman who had a reputation washed his feet with her tears and dried his feet with her hair, what he was thinking in that moment, he's concerned for her well-being and her safety and her honor. That's what he's thinking. And when John the Baptist leans over and puts his head on his chest at the Last Supper, what Jesus is thinking, he's concerned about the health and the guidance and direction of his new church. That's what he's thinking. And so uh, we talked about five different ways that conflict happens in church. Uh, conflict can happen because of feelings. Sometimes we don't want to admit that. We think, well, we're always spiritual, we're always intellectual, but sometimes we just feel things very strongly. And, and sometimes those feelings become part of what dictate us. And then uh, there's legitimate differences. You could think of this happening in your mind. Maybe it's not emotional at all. You really think differently than the person beside you. You've got a difference of opinion. And then the third way that conflict can arise is because there's different styles of people. I mean, think about this. In the body of Christ, you've got two guys standing beside each other. One of them has on a cowboy hat and a bolo tie. The other one has a rapper's trucker hat and a chain. And they both love Jesus. And they have different styles. One's not right and the other wrong. There's just different shades among us. The fourth way that conflict can happen is because of misunderstandings. That is, my brain tries to communicate to your brain and something happens where it breaks down in the process of communication. We misunderstand one another. Then we said the fifth way that conflict can happen is just simply that we're sinners. We are sinners saved by grace. And every single day, this body with its carnal nature has to be brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And uh, the carnal nature has to be kicked to the curb. So that was week one. And just to review just a moment last week, we talked about parameters and priorities. The teaching was all about relationships. Jesus, get this, Jesus had some really strong words about the relationships of our families. Jesus said, I have come to bring a sword, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. The enemies of one's man, uh, of a man will be the members of his own household. Strong words. Uh, at first glance, you read that and you sort of think, what? Are you kidding me? Uh, what do you mean by, are you serious? That's in the Bible? I thought that Jesus was all about warm, cozy feelings. But that's a tough statement. Well, 
Jesus isn't a killjoy. He's not out to make our lives miserable or, or anything like that. He just wants us to love him the most. Amen. We love our family, but we love him more. So that is the main point of that teaching, that yes, you love your father, you love your mother, but you love Jesus more. You love your son, you love your daughter, but you love Jesus more. You love your aunt, you love your uncle, you love your cousin, you love all of the beautiful family that God has given you, but you love Jesus more. And so um, that was really uh, a special time when it was driven home last week. Now, today's sermon is titled Interaction and Interception. And I'm reading these words from Matthew chapter 22. And I ask you to follow along with me. It reads like this, Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. The Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, do you have the picture in your mind? Pharisees are coming up. Sadducees struck out. So here comes the Pharisees. Let us have a crack at him. And then you read this in verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Wow, what a powerful statement. Jesus is talking to people who had memorized the law. The Pharisees had committed to memory the entire first five books of the Bible, Torah, or the law. They had it committed to memory. And he says, love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. By the way, guys, the law and the prophets, think of Samuel, think of Nehemiah, think of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Elijah. All of the law and the prophets hinge, hang on these two commandments. And after these verses are over at the end of the chapter, Jesus has another question for the Pharisees, and they are just stumped. They have no answer. So both the Pharisees, the, the Pharisees, how do you like that? I just, I just made a new word. Look for that one to be in the dictionary next year. Both the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, both of them are silenced. I mean, they both just decide, you know what's best? Let's just keep our mouths shut. And everybody is scratching their head saying, who is this guy? I want to point out two things to you this morning. And here's the first one. This is a roast session. A roast. Some of you, some of you remember the old Dean Martin roast. You know what a roast is in current culture? It's like when you're just boom, you're just zipping one-liners at each other, and then there's a comeback, and it just goes on and on. So we've got this roasting session going on between the Pharisees and Jesus, and who do you think is going to win? Now. I remember during my coaching days, some of the most comical times would happen riding in the bus with the boys. And, and you know what it's like. The coach is up there driving the bus, and the team is back there just having a big old time, right? And sometimes they would get into these roast sessions. 
And as long as it wasn't mean-spirited, you know, I'd, I'd let it go. Like, if it would get really, really bad, if they started going over the edge, and I'd, I'd say, hey, guys, all right, knock it off. But, but, I mean, they would get into these hilarious, you know, they would do the whole yo mama jokes thing. And, um, uh, or they might pick on somebody if they did some really very unathletic move on the floor. You know, they'd kind of make fun of that. We, we had this one kid that was so funny. I mean, he was just hilarious. And he, he just had, he had this amazing gift to make you laugh. He would tell stories, and his voice would kind of rise and fall, and have this funny kind of delivery, and, and he, he knew when to say it at just the right time. His delivery was just spot on, and man, he would say something that was so funny, and everybody would just crack up laughing. One thing he'd do, like when he was roasting someone, if he really got under their skin, he had a long old finger, he'd point it at them and he'd say, I'm on you! Then we had this other kid that wasn't funny. He thought he was funny. <laughs> Nobody else thought it was funny. You know anybody like this? Uh, the delivery is off. His voice is kind of monotone. The timing was just all wrong. And he would try to make everybody laugh. And he would say something. And then it would get to that point where, in his mind, it was just going to erupt in laughter. And he would give the punchline. And then you would sort of hear, cricket, cricket, cricket. <laughs> and that in itself was funny. But as long as it wasn't mean-spirited, you know, uh, no personal attacks about <laughs> You know, how someone looks or maybe something that they couldn't control, like um, their dress, for instance, the way the clothes they wore, something that's out of their hands. Uh, I found it sometimes to be very amazing team building. Now, the Sadducees and the Pharisees are not team players. They do not want Jesus on their team. They are mean-spirited and the burn session went too far I mean we're beyond roasting for fun they literally want to roast him right but he just keeps silencing them they they want to win but they can't one-up him they they can't outwit him they can't point their finger at him and say I'm on you In fact, it's the other way around. Like we read in verse 34, Jesus has just silenced them. Jesus is the one who could say, up, oh, silence. Jesus could say, oh, it is over. Jesus is the one who could say, toast it. But here's the kicker. They thought it was about being superior. Once Jesus silenced them, they might have expected Him to gloat a little bit, to celebrate His one-upmanship, but that's not Jesus, is it? And don't you see, the irony of it all is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are using God's Word and their knowledge of God's Word to catapult them into prominence. Now think about what they're doing. They have studied the Word their whole lives. They're using the Word to catapult them into prominence. And it's just wrong. It's, it's so wrong and it's very ironic. Now here's the second thing that I want to point out to you. Descend into leadership. The descent into leadership. You, you know, the American dream is all about climbing up the ladder. And that kind of thinking has even crept into church circles. 
And that's a real shame. Now, I don't want you to think that there's many that are this way because there's, you know, it's always the case there's just a few rotten apples that spoil the whole batch. But I know personally of ministers who use ministry as a stepping stone to advance their own agenda. I bet you know people like that in your occupation who use something to get ahead. And, and use is a good word for it. It's, it's a, it's, these are people that they have just got to get what they want. And that's sad. That's so wrong. Think of how in America, think of how we perceive leadership. We tip our cards with the way that we use certain lingo and certain phrases. We will say things like, she's rising in the ranks. She's a rising star. Or we'll say, he's moving up. He's climbing. But Jesus, when he is given the opportunity to say, up, oh, silence. When Jesus could say, it is over, he could say, toast it. But he doesn't do that. Jesus could say, oh yeah, right? But Jesus doesn't do that. So, some of you really like that. It is not a new worship move. On but instead, get this, instead he descended into leadership. This is a phrase that our leaders have heard me starting to use here lately. I want to show you this chart. Um, many churches are built on the idea of the pastor being all things to all people. And, and I mean, he's God's man of power for the hour. He is the Bible answer man. He is Johnny on the spot. And the pastor is put way up here in an unattainable, unrealistic position. I'm all about honoring pastors. I've been under seven different pastors, and I've always honored the pastor. But the effective model is built this way. Jesus, of course, is our foundation. He's the foundation, the foundations of Christ. Everything is built upon Him. And the power of God you know, signs and wonders, God doing healings, God creating faith in people's heart, and God doing things that only God can do that are impossible for man. The power of God and people support, that is, people who say, I'm going to partner with the ministry, I'm going to stand with this church, I'm going to do everything I can to build up God's kingdom here in the congregation. Those two things shore up leadership but the irony is, the further you go in leadership, you don't go higher, but you descend into leadership. And the further you go in leadership, you have more responsibility and fewer rights. Let that sink in. You know, this, this has been the ministry model for Calvary Church in uh, Newport Mesa for decades. And that is that if you're going to be a leader in this church, that the further you go in leadership, the more responsibility you have and the less rights you have. You, you sacrifice, you lay it down, you just, you give up so that those around you can advance. I mean, this is how Jesus was. He, he could have said, do you guys think you know what it means to love God with all your heart? You don't. When you truly 
Love God with all of your heart. Listen up. You will love your neighbor the same way that you love yourself. In fact, even better. You know, we're Christians, right? I mean, am I right to assume that? We're good, upstanding citizens, aren't we? I hope. Let me tell you a little story. There's a guy, he's traveling from Albuquerque to L.A. He, he's got to get there because his dad had major surgery and his mom is uh, just trying to take care of him as he recovers. He's on limited funds, so he's traveling by Greyhound. And the bus pulls into the bus station in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And the driver says, we're going to refuel. We'll be leaving in 15 minutes. And so the guy says, I think I've got just enough time to go get a snack. Someone had told him that right around the corner was a convenience store. He could go in there and get snacks. He's got just enough time to get back on the bus before they leave. And so he takes off into an unknown direction. He veers around a corner and he's walking down. And the further he goes, he realizes something doesn't look right. This seems like I'm in an alley. And sure enough, wham, somebody clubs him over the head. I mean, he gets knocked out. And he's dazed and he's trying to struggle. The last thing he remembers before he passes out is that some guys are carrying him off and putting him in a vehicle. He has no idea where he's going. Well, when he came to, it was just starting to get dark. He wasn't thinking clearly. He had a big knot on his head, and it was all dirty, and he had been beaten. And not only that, they took his identification, they took his money. He didn't, he didn't have two dimes to rub together. Nothing. I mean, it was all gone. No car keys, nothing. So here he is in a strange city, and he's trying to figure out, what do I do next? He struggles to get up on his feet, and he begins to walk through the streets, and he goes to the corner, and he's waving at traffic that's just passing by at breakneck speed, and no one seems to care. And so the next thing you know, he's, he's realizing it's starting to get dark. He flag down a couple of people that are walking by and say, can you please help me? And they literally laughed at him. Get away from me. Shoved him away. And so now this, this helpless man, it, it's getting later and later. And, and as the night goes on, every once in a while, he sees a police car flash by him real fast. And about two in the morning, he realizes, I'm going to be out here on the streets all night. And so, he found this refrigerator box that had been left in one of the alleys. He dragged it out of the alley onto one of the main streets and found a, a storefront, a little storefront that was vacated, and he put it there on the concrete, and, and he laid down on it. That was his mattress. He folded, folded half of the box over him to give him cover, and that's where he slept for the night. When he came to in the morning, he woke up. The sun was starting to beat down on him. He remembered all the events of the day. He's in a strange city. He doesn't know where to go. His head is pounding. He's filthy. He looks like a vagrant. And he's just sitting there, dazed, trying to figure out what his next step's going to be. There were a couple of AG pastors. They were in town for general council. And they were walking from their hotel, going back to the convention center. And one of them looked over at him and said, look at that poor guy. He sure looks like he could use a hand. But the other one said, you know, the plenary session starts in 20 minutes. We don't want to miss the opening. It's going to be the best. And they just kept right on walking. And there were 
a couple of nurses that were working that day, they had just come out of the coffee house. They were even in their uniforms and everything. And um, they're headed back to their car. And one of them says, wow, look at that guy over there. He really needs help. You know, maybe we could go clean him up. But the other one was smarter and she, she said, we don't know where this guy been. Look how unkempt he is. He, he looked, he's a mess. Why, we don't even know what kind of diseases he has. We don't even have our gloves for Pete's sake. We better not touch him. And they walked on by. And coming from the other direction, there was a wealthy man. He was in town because he had a chance to score big on some real estate. Great opportunity. He could turn over and make some quick cash. And he's walking towards the coffee house with his Mercedes Benz key fob in his hand. And the thought goes through his mind, you know, maybe I ought to give this guy 20 bucks. Why, well, I'd never miss it. But just that quick, he reasoned to himself and he says, I'm not going to be dumb. That guy will probably just take it and blow it on booze. Why, well, I'm not going to give him any money. And then there was a migrant worker who came past. He was in town because he was here with a green card and he was working legally to become a citizen of the United States. And he'd been saving his dollars for the very expensive task of becoming a United States citizen. And he walked over to the man and he said, are you okay? Here, let me help you up. He said, man, you look like you've been through a rough time. I tell you what, man, right over here at the Circle K down the street, for this dollar here and for some change, you can get you a coffee and a breakfast burrito. Come on, man, let's go. And he opens up his pickup truck and moves the tools into the back and says, here, you climb in there, you sit right there. They drive down to the little store. The man tastes some hot coffee and he starts to feel alive again. And he eats a breakfast burrito. The migrant worker says to him, I know, I know that you need to go to the hospital or maybe to the police station. I have a very important meeting. I'm going to get some papers to be a citizen. But I promise you I will come back. And then you stay here in the shade and then I will drive you to the hospital. And as he's driving off, he rolls down the window and says, Dios le bendiga. Now I ask you, which one of these was a better citizen? Which one was the neighbor? It's a modern parable. How, do, how does Jesus descend into leadership when he has the opportunity to silence his competition instead of lifting himself up, he gives us a picture of what it means to be a true neighbor. Now you see, Matthew in his gospel, he doesn't tell us this because he has another point that he wants to drive home. And actually, I chose to use Matthew's Gospel this morning because I had a point of my own that I wanted to drive home. But Luke, in his Gospel, tells the exact same story. And he says that when he had silenced them, one bozo says, oh yeah, well who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the story that I just told to you. And the point of his parables was not so that there could be this great revelation knowledge. Usually, he really wanted people to stop and think about it. He really wanted people to stop and think. His, his parables, sometimes they didn't strike quite the right tone. Sometimes they really weren't received well. But they, they forced you to stop and think real hard. So this morning we've been talking about interaction 
and intercession. If the Holy Spirit this week would use your interaction to intercept someone's pain. Did you know that we live in a county that has 26% Spanish speaking as the first language in the home? And in our territory, this edge of Buckeye, it's 29%. Did you know that the Assemblies of God is one of the few denominations that has continued to grow over the last 15 years? And do you know why? I'm proud to tell you that 42% of Assemblies of God people are non-Caucasian. That is to say, African American, Hispanic, Asian, um, I forget what I've, you know what I mean, but all the different races are growing by leaps and bounds in the United States. And, and it's important for us to learn, to understand, if we're going to be part of an end time harvest, then that harvest is going to just be like it has been all of the first 10 years of our stay here in Buckeye, at Buckeye First Assembly. It's going to be multi-ethnic. There's going to be colors of every race, and we're going to be worshiping together our one Lord. So here's the action point. This week, let your love for God allow you to lose on purpose so that someone else can win. This week, allow your love for God to allow you to lose on purpose so that someone else can win. That's going to look different for each person. Maybe it means that you drive differently. <laughs> you, that's, that's kind of my personal prayer request. I'm learning. I just want to think I've got it, you guys. Then I realize, oh, I've got a long way to go. And I, hope, I had a couple of fails this last week. But it, it could be traffic. It could be driving slower. It could be letting someone in, letting off the gas. And, and being friendly. Or, 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 get this, maybe you know the right answer. Maybe you know the right answer, but your friend is not there yet. And your friend doesn't realize they don't know the right answer, but the situation demands that what would be best for now is not to shame them, not to put them down, but just to let them discover it as they go. Or it could be that you take the back seat on something that you really deserve. Maybe you deserve the credit at the job. You're the one that did the work. Why are they recognizing her? She didn't do it. It was me. But you say, you know what? This is my chance to let someone else win. What does it really matter in the vast configuration of things? I will go to the back seat and let them win. Let the Holy Spirit lead you this week. I know it will involve sacrifice so that someone else can survive. And I'm not saying throw yourself under the bus all the time. That's not what I mean. But I am saying to learn, to learn the, that ability to just recognize a moment and a chance to let someone else excel. Band, would, would you come up as I pray? Father, we, we, keep, we keep peeling back these layers of sharing the vision that you have put upon us as a church family is to find our purpose in Christ and share. But if we're going to share, it means that we have to keep peeling back these layers. So just keep doing your work, O oh Lord. 
Father, you know that this today seems to have been such an unusual message. Maybe not. It, may, it could just be the delivery boy feeling that way. But, but it's so particular and, and so specific that I don't know if it really applies to all of us. I, I think it probably applies to all of us in some way or another. But, but for a few of us, it may have really touched a tender spot inside of us. So I'm just praying for my brothers and sisters to be encouraged, to be strengthened, and to be uplifted today as a result of being in your house. Here's what I, I feel led to pray. I'm not going to have you stand up. I won't have a show of hands. But I'm just wondering if some of you would be honest. It, I mean, just really honest and just say, you know, this is an area where I struggle. This is an area that needs improvement in me. For some reason, I can't seem to let others get the credit. I, I can't seem to just let go. And, and if there are a few of you that are wrestling with that right now in your spirit, I just want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will help you and that there will be a, a, real, a real change in your, in your heart. this, but the Holy Spirit just reminded me of it, and it must be that I should share it with you. Uh, this last week, I was talking with Zach, and um, all of you know that Zach is in a pretty serious situation where he's, he's in jail. God has done such amazing things in his heart and his life. He shared this story with me. He said, I was in my cell, and it was almost time for our group to get out and go into the common area. And, and he said, I remembered a verse that God put on my heart way back when I first came here. And, and it was Jude, verse 23. And then he, he quoted it. I don't know if I can quote it, but it's something about um, snatch some of them as if you're just snatching them right out of the fire. And then it says, and still others, show them mercy, but do it cautiously. Don't imitate their lifestyle because you don't want to be affected by the sin that so separates them from the Lord. And so, Zach, then the, the doors opened and he, he came out from his second floor to go down the stairs into the common area. Determined to practice that. And he said, Dad, as I got to the top stairs, A place where chaplains very rarely even get to get in. Most people with high level credentials only get to speak through a glass. 
But he's right there giving them cookies, sharing his, um, his snacks and, and just loving them. That's, that's a picture to me for us of the descent into leadership, that it's always, always all about them, always. It's always all about them. So, Heavenly Father, I, I do now just I extend my hand over this group and I'm praying. Lord, uh, we all have different personalities. It could be that there's several here that this is just an area of struggle, you know, that I don't know why, but I always feel like I've got to be first. It's I just I know that I struggle with that. I've got to I've got to have my agenda and I, I'm pushy on that and I, I always want to win. And this day, I'm saying to you, I surrender my agenda. I surrender. I just let go. I let go, God. I am trusting you to lead my steps. For the ones of you that agreed in prayer with me just now, you expect it. You watch what happens this week as you're going through this week. The doors and the opportunities that open up for you. That the, the Lord, the God of heaven is going to use you in amazing ways. <laughs> Let's all stand together. And may God bless you guys. Thank you for being here.